Religion can't be divorced from social, political, and historical contexts and issues. No, it cannot. And hey, everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Atheist Apostate. I'm your host, The AA, and we are back here with something a little, little bit different, but not too different. We're not here with a rebuttal. We're not here with any real history history. We are here with something to establish where we are coming from, or at least where I'm coming from when I talk about things in a historical and scholarly manner. And as we are going to be addressing things in the uh, Christian faith uh, pretty soon, and the Bible will be coming up, especially the New Testament and the reliability of it, I needed to make sure we knew right off the bat Despite what your faith is, despite what your minister, priest, uh, you know, uh, pastor may have taught you, what scholarship says, what history says, what the people in the top professionals in the field say, is what I go by. So, and one of the things that we're going to be talking about is the gospel, um, the gospels, and Paul reliable, are they? And I'm going to contend yes and no. No, they're not reliable as a true historical account. They are reliable if you're only going to take them upon faith and upon a religious aspect. So, are they forged or are they pseudepigraphas? Forged or pseudepigrapha? What does that mean? The same thing depending on what you're talking about. If you're talking about a non-religious book, you use the word forged. If you're talking about a religious text, like uh, the Old Testament, the New Testament, other religious documents, you use pseudopigrapha, which means you pretty don't much don't know who the author is, but they are claiming to be writing in another person's name, which we would call a forgery. And this is what we're going to get on. We are going to be hearing from four different uh, people, basically. So we're going to be hearing from three uh, Christian uh, 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 points of view and one atheistic point of view. And our atheistic point of view happens to be one of the top leading scholars in uh, biblical uh, scholarship, especially New Testament, early New Testament documents. So, and Greek, and that is Professor Bart Ehrman. So who uh, is the uh, head at uh, Bible Hill, or Bible Hill, Chapel Hill. So in the, uh, you know, uh, department, we're going to be hearing from a theologian and a scholar, uh, Dr. Daryl uh, Bach, right here. We heard opening up with uh, Professor Dale Martin, who is a New Testament, early New Testament, uh, first century Historian for Yale University. It's one of his courses that I take directly from and then we use another uh, Scholar and apologist and minister in this video and none of them are Disagreeing with what this video is going to be about not one of them are going to disagree and this is why we need to do this video and establish that we actually don't know who the authors are of uh, the uh, synoptic, synoptic Gospels in John. We only know of seven official letters from Paul that we can prove. And the rest are either unknowns or pseudepigraphas, a.k.a. forgeries. And I'm about to make my presentation here. Instead of switching over like I usually do, like sub like lists, Today we are going to just have this up larger till we get to some of the documents and when I get to YouTube or YouTube to uh, website pages where I have to enlarge it a bit more instead of you having to come down here and read this small little screen we will fade over to this screen here to make it easier for your eyes. Alright so let's go back here and not miss the first word of what we have to hear uh, coming uh, from uh, Bart Ehrman's opponent. Texts and issues. You, you're very familiar with all the issues that, that Bart has brought up in his book. Um, okay, and this is the radio uh, host, the interviewer, who's uh, talking to Daryl uh, Bach, uh, Dar and Dr. Uh, Bach, and uh, Bach is about to reply. Uh, for you, uh, do you do, what do you make of, of what Bart is doing in kind of 
putting this stuff out to a more lay audience, a more popular audience. Uh, helpful, unhelpful? Should Christians be worried? Christians, Christians, should you guys be worried? So is uh, Doug from Pine Creek with you uh, saying, are you scared? Scared. So are you guys scared? Are you worried? Well, I actually think there is some value in what Bart is doing in terms of um, letting people know what the conversation is about the Bible among scholars. There yes, what the conversation is amongst Bible scholars on the topic we are covering right here. So right on here. There is a huge conversation that's been going on in many cases on many of these issues for several hundred years. Did you guys hear that? For several hundred years there has been discussions on this issue. So there, this isn't something new, this isn't something recent, this has been for hundreds of years now. So into the uh, 16, 1700s at least they've been uh, talking about this. And. Uh, having people be aware of what that discussion actually is and, and the rationale for it is helpful. Yes, it is. And that's why I feel the need to do this video before we really get into any Christian theology and Christian history because we need to understand about the Bible before we start having the Bible used as a source of reference. So let's hear what Dr. Or Dr. Professor Bart Ehrman has to say. So a uh, Christian, not he's not Christian, he's atheist, a Christian New Testament uh, professor. He is a teacher. So he teaches this. He is unbiased in his classes as he teaches. That's why he has these talks and books. Forgery was not looked upon as an acceptable practice in antiquity. And yet people practiced forgery. Christians practiced forgery from outside the New Testament, such as the Gospel of Peter, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Apostolic Constitutions. But are there any forgeries inside the New Testament? Okay. And he is mentioning books that are considered uh, non-canonical or Gnostic, you know, one or the other, or both. There were several, and unlike the Da Vinci Code, we will do a debunking the Da Vinci Code uh, video down the road. What's the channel without doing a debunking the Da Vinci Code? But he is talking about books that were excluded by the church's uh, heads. So there wasn't just one church, the Catholic Church. You know, we had uh, the uh, Ro church in Rome, the church in Antioch, the church in Constantinople and the uh, church in uh, Egypt, Alexand or Alexandria. So uh, the Coptic church, what uh, survived out of the two, uh, four, the Coptic and the, um, pretty much the Catholic Universal Church were the two survivors. But anyways, so not to go off topic here, what they're talking about is if a book could not be related to someone directly related to an apostle of Jesus or one of their direct uh, apostles, one of the apostles, apostles, disciples, then it was not included in the Bible. If it was contrary to doctrine and Gnostic, it was excluded from the Bible. So only books they believed they could verify came from uh, a uh, po or apostolic line were included. And they'll talk a bit about more and you can go and learn more about that too. Uh, that's not what this is here. We'll talk about that later on in the Da Vinci Code. If we're gonna do that though, let's imagine what kind of community this ancient guy we're going to call Mark. We're going to continue to call him Mark, even though we don't believe that it was the historical John Mark who wrote the gospel. Okay, I'm going to pause right here. I was going to add this in later in the video to show what the period of was in the Roman world, the first century uh, uh, <coughs> CE, um, uh, CE, I call it Christian era. I don't call it AD, I BCE, before Christian era, Christian era. So, but I decided to put it here because Professor Dale Martin even mentions we do not know who writes it. We will assume we know who writes it and we'll play along with the game. So let's hear what he says here. Community, this ancient guy we're going to call Mark. We're going to continue to call him Mark, even though we don't believe that it was the historical John Mark who wrote the gospel. And I learned that also when I was taking my first year of theology. This was nothing new to me. This was the last straw that broke the camel's back on was learning. Unfortunately, I didn't learn about Paul properly because it was Paulinism and then this that broke my back. So, but yes, I learned as many ministers and laymen end up uh, learning, uh, people who are going to become preachers, ministers, priests. We learn this stuff in school. 
But for convenience sake, we just call them the gospel writers Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For convenience sake. Well, how do the ancient church view forgeries? Okay. So, Bart Ehrman's telling us there's forgeries. Let's get to this before we get in. Bart Ehrman's telling us there's forgeries. So, he's asking, do we have any in the Bible? Professor Marn is letting us know we do not know who these authors are, and we'll learn more about what we call that. But right now, we're going to our first minister here. This is a minister in one of his sermons, and let's hear what he has to say about pseudepigrapha writings. Well, how did the ancient church view forgeries? If they discovered that a book was... See, and he doesn't even use pseudepigrapha. He uses the word forgery like Bart does. He's a friend and uh, blend about what it is. Not written by the person who, who claimed to, to write it, that was attributed to it, they would always throw it out. Is that? And he says they would always throw that book out. That is incorrect because we do not know who wrote Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. We don't. So we will find out how we got those names attributed to the books sooner. What we need to establish is we don't know who did. So and what they did or did not accept for forgeries, you know, or pseudepigraphas. We'll use forgeries. So because we have two that are using the straight up word forgery. So what does Dr. Ehrman say? Let's go a little bit back here so we can get his full words. They would always throw it out. Is that in fact there are books of this sort in the New Testament? Bo so there are books like that, like I said, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But are they pseudepigraphas slash forgeries or anonymous? So we know Paul's works and some others like First and Second Peter and those are forgeries. Books that claim to be written by apostles that were not written by those apostles. That book is to be rejected. It doesn't matter if it's squeaky clean, orthodox. Uh... So it doesn't matter if it's squeaky clean and orthodox. Like I said a few minutes ago, when they were compiling the Bible finally, and unlike the Da Vinci Code, it was not at the first council of Nicaea that came later. So when they were officially compiling the first official, which became the 27 books, if it did not have a direct association with one of the apostles of Jesus, as in one of their disciples, uh, the apostles' disciples, or like they believe John and Matthew are in this uh, here, in the books here attributed to them, they were not included. There were many true. There were many books in circulation, not thousands like Da Vinci Code said, but there were many in circulation. So probably under 100, I'd be guessing, you know, from what we know of mentioned in the past and what we found to seem to line up for what's found and hoping to be found. But, you know, it wasn't as many as the Da Vinci Code makes you think with thousands and thousands. So probably more like probably under 50, but some uh, proposed more around 80 that I've heard. Anyways, some of those did make it into the New Testament. So because we knew from early on that there was disputed Paul letters and he will talk about this. So the disputed Paul letters we'll hear about aren't anything new either. So he's not being honest because we know books made it into the New Testament that were not written by the authors that they're claimed to be written for. Agrees with the Westminster Confession of Faith or Biola's doctrinal statement, it didn't matter. The fact is that that book was not part of scripture. There are. So how, like Bart's going to explain, do we get books inside the New Testament that, uh, Testament then that are like that? There are books of this sort in the New Testament, books that claim to be written by apostles that were not written by those apostles. Give you just a couple of examples. Christians, Christians, did you hear this? He's going to give you examples where someone who's admitting about, uh, forgeries in the early Christian days and how they distinguished between forgeries to get them out because no scholar disagreed with what I said how you know the comp compilation of the Bible was if it wasn't directly to an apostle and their disciple of Jesus so or if it was Gnostic if it was uh, associated to one of Jesus' apostles or their disciples it could have been in so first second Clement perfect example they weren't sure it went out Though how the book of Revelations, which is very Gnostic, made it in is a very, very good question. Because if it was Gnostic, it was out. So straight up. And that's why we don't have uh, the, um, uh, what's the name, uh, the uh, one for Peter. 
Uh, there's a book written supposedly by Peter when he's in Rome and is very, very Gnostic in writing, and they do not like that and not part of canon. So let's hear what Bart has to say more. I've already indicated that writing books in the name of Peter was a wide practice. It was widely practiced even in earlier times. In the New Testament, there are two books that claim to be written by Peter, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. Scholars are virtually unified, uh, with the exception of fundamentalists and very conservative evangelicals. Yes, and Bart is straight up and honest, minus the evangelicals and a lot of fundamentalists. So, like Mormonism, which I was a member of for many a year, so most of my life. Everybody else agrees that whoever wrote Second Peter, it was not the author of First Peter. They have completely different writing styles, which if you read them in Greek, they are as different as if you, uh, if you read Mark Twain and T.S. Eliot. Yeah, so if someone tried to write in my style and write a book, uh, I'm a poet. If someone tried to mimic my writing, so you could probably tell the differences between my writing and theirs, even if they're trying to do mimic it. And this author of 1st and 2nd Peter, the authors, authors don't even try to mimic each other's writing. They are very different writing styles. Moreover, almost everybody agrees that 2nd Peter was not written by Peter. What about 1st Peter? Uh... All right, let's go back to Daryl Bach here. Let's see what he has to say. Theist Christian, he is also slash theologian and scholar. So what does he have to say? So many of the materials in the New Testament are, are not written by the authors who claim to write them. They're not written by the authors who claim to write them. If you watch more of that interview, he will uh, admit and say that it is a little problematic on our side because we do get the information of that from church leaders, you know, further church leaders. Yes, I'm going to roll a joint. So, but if you look at those church leaders and where those sources come from, they come from mainly Eusebius. And we'll get to Eusebius uh, shortly. Well, not shortly, uh, soon enough though. And see who our friend Eusebius is and why Eusebius cannot be trusted. I don't think Peter wrote 1st Peter or 2nd Peter, and the reason I don't think he wrote 1st Peter And I don't either, and I will be agreeing with Bart, and we'll be covering that in a bit too. 2nd Peter is because I don't think Peter could write. Yes, longevity in the ancient world. All right, let's finally get to our screens here. Oh, let's restore. I had a crash earlier. Life expectancy in the ancient world. Let's pull this up for you guys. And we're going to switch over. I told you I'll fade over. So <clears throat> this is, and before I get into it, this is important for two reasons. One, we're going to hear again from uh, Professor uh, Martin on who is literate in this ancient world of Rome, but also the claims of, um, you know, uh, apostle, uh, apostolic uh, succession also falls apart because of what it says here and that's part of the defense we're going to be using on one of our sites here so if it wants to load six ancient sources oh wrong one wrong one six ancient sources so see guys six ancient sources that identify the gospels and that's going to break down in a moment so let's go back over here to the life expectancy. So not only did we have a problem with literate people, we had a problem with the life expectancy because of the times. And this is going to be relevant. So the average lifespan was 35 to 40 years average of people in the Western world up into the dark, the Middle Ages, and the Renaissance until the 19th and the 20th centuries. So, if you come from that time period, if you come from that time period, this is what they're going to tell you right here. So, ambitious or talented young men, or young men like Herod the Great's 19-year-old son, uh, Archelaus, who inherited kingdoms, were forced to grow up quickly. By age 20 in their life was already over. Half their life was already over. So by the age of 20. So this was the Lord man also. We're going to get told about Peter. So we're going to get told what type of life he lived. 
what type of life as a peasant, a fisherman, so who had even less of a life expectancy because they spent all their time working and trying to survive. No time to read and we're even told about his literacy soon. Even told about it. So let's go back here. What do we know about Peter? Well, in the New Testament, he's a fisherman in, in rural Galilee. Were fishermen in rural Galilee educated? Were they guys? Were fishermen and, uh, you know, you're out all day, morning to night, throwing a net. So you're trying to catch fish. You're coming home. You're cleaning that fish. You're salting that fish with your, you know, family to preserve it so it doesn't rot on you. So you can store it and sell it for others and eat it yourself. Is he going to have time to go and learn his letters, to learn his words? And we're going to learn more about this soon. We're going to learn more about this. So especially when they only had a short life expectancy, 40 at the max, 35 to 40 on average, and that's if you were wealthy and healthy, wealthy and healthy. Remember that guys, wealthy and healthy. The answer is almost certainly no. There have been studies of literacy in the ancient world that indicate that at the best of times in the ancient world, maybe 10% of the population could read. Far fewer than that 10% could write and I think Bart mentions that it's about 3 or 4%. I've seen studies anywhere uh, from 3 to 5%. So the consensus is the consensus is between 3 and 4%. And by right, I mean actually copy out letters. Fewer than that could compose, and fewer than that could compose something that was very elegant. First Peter is written in highly elegant Greek. Highly elegant Greek. I won't argue the Greek part. I won't. And Bart's going to make a good point here soon, though. But in the ancient world, when Rome took over, and we're going to see this shortly coming up to you, I, I went and got this intentionally. When Rome took over a territory, so they didn't impose the Latin and their way, their way was Hellen, Hellen, Hellenistic, which was Greek. So, and they just pretty much took the Greek gods and gave them Roman names and kept the uh, Greek way, including the writing, and just tweaked off of uh, the uh, Etruscans, who ended up, uh, you know, uh, taken from the Greeks as well. And eventually the Romans took over them and assimilated them into their culture before we even got into Judea. The Apostle Peter was a, an illiterate fisherman. By the way, he's called illiterate in the New Testament. Acts chapter 4 verse 13 says that Peter was illiterate. Yes, and this is why I'm not saying, or the uh, atheist, uh, or the Muslim, or the Jew, or anyone else who's not Christian attacks the, and I say attacks because I get accused of attacking uh, Peter for not being illiterate. How do you know he wasn't illiterate? Because the author of Acts, the companion, the supposed companion of Paul, the author of Acts and Luke, in Acts tells us Peter was not literate. That's why he had a scribe, Mark John, and that's why it's believed that Mark, the gospel according to Mark, is Mark John, the scribe companion, scribe, I use quotations because we do not know, and he's going to tell us this, that he was even truly a scribe in that way. Unlettered. Agramatos is the Greek. Unlettered, unable to, unable to read the letters. Uh, his language is Aramaic, the language of Palestine. First Peter is written in a highly literate Greek. Estimates of literacy in Palestine at this time uh, indicate that probably 3% of the population could read in Palestine. Far like I said, I've heard 3 to 5%. The consensus I usually hear is between 3 and 4. 3 and 4. He's taking the lower end. The higher end is 5. The, you know, 3 to 4. So I usually say about 4%. And I have a book that I write. And I go with 4, splitting the 3 and the 5. Uh, you know... Okay, it's between that. There's experts that are more saying it's between three and four percent. So even though it could be five, three to four, so let's say four. Let's go say five and four. Fewer than in the population at large because it's largely a rural area, and reading and writing is taught mainly in urban areas among the arist aristocratic elite. Yeah, so in places like Jerusalem, so where it would have the priests who would have been the ones teaching. So, and the rabbis, that's where rabbi teacher. So, and when Jesus was able to read from the Torah, it was memorization. They started getting memorizing the Torah from yay high in their day. Even before that, even now they still do. Who can afford the time and the leisure for an education. Peter was not in that group. 
No, he was not in the group that could afford the time and the leisure. Those who were wealthy, those who had money, those who were merchants, those who were the kings. So those were the ones who did. Peter was a fisherman trying to survive, throwing a net day and night. That's why I said this was important starting off with, uh, with uh, what's his name, uh, Dale Martin. Now it is theoretically possible that after the resurrection, Peter decided to go back to school. And he took some evening classes, and uh, as his foreign language requirement, he took Greek. Uh, and then, uh, then he got pretty good at it, and he decided he would take some composition classes, and he got pretty good at Greek composition, and so that at the end of his life, he wrote First Peter. And, you know, he's going to, you know, yeah, in a second you'll hear his closing comments, but, you know, we're going to hear from a non-religious group historian side, and it's pretty much going to conform with here, so Peter... If he did, you know, for sake of argument, like Bart says, if Peter, for sake of argument, did learn Greek and then advanced Greek, he would be up there with the likes of Plato and, you know, Socrates and uh, Tacitus and, you know, all those famous, you know, uh, scholars and historians. And yet, outside of the Bible, we get zilch about that. Zilch about that outside of the Bible. Zilch. I mean, theoretically, it's possible, but it seems unlikely. Now, a number of you are saying, maybe, maybe he dictated it and a scribe wrote it down. Maybe a... Yes, and that's where we get Mark John. Because if he was able to learn Greek, if he was able to discover Greek, so or not discover, uh, uh, learn the ability, he would have no need for a scribe. But then if he was able to compose such books like he's accredited to, uh, you know, uh, writing. So if we took that, then why did no other writer of the time period mention... Peter as a great writer of a important book. We do we do hear about Paul. Mm -hmm. We do, you know. There, there's, you know, Paul has been cited outside, so that's how we know Paul uh, as a historical source is then made up. You know, we know about Peter, but no one says Peter was a learned man who ended up writing a book, educated himself, and wrote, wrote a book. This is where we get to the scribe, the scribe, Mark John, the claimed scribe. The secretary produced it for him. I'm getting some nods. Yes, a lot of you are thinking that because a lot of people say that. One of the things I try to show in my book is that it didn't work that way in the ancient world. This idea that you could have secretaries write books for you, there is no basis for it in the evidence that survives from antiquity at all. No basis for it. Even though it's another thing scholars say all the time. Peter probably didn't write first and second Peter because he couldn't write. There are 13 letters that claim to be written by Paul in the New Testament. Oh, we're getting to Paul now. Yes, guys, Paul. I tell you, Paul's disputed as well. And we're going to hear about the disputes on Paul here now. Let's hear. For you Christians who are not aware, a lot of your core doctrine comes off of the teachings of Paul. I was taught the same thing in school. Once I discovered, once I discovered, and I was just learning that not only were the four Gospels anonymous, they didn't call them uh, pseudepigraphus, they called them anonymous. So uh, Dale Martin, and I will go into that uh, shortly here, we'll hear from Dale Martin on the differences. So, but once I heard that there was at least six uh, contested uh, pseudepigraphus on Paul, and some of those were where some of the core teachings of Christianity came from, that was the end of it for me. I was like, well, it's false. Christianity is false. It's Pauline-based teachings. So, well, no, not really Pauline-based. It's more the early church fathers-based. Scholars talk about the seven undisputed Pauline epistles because six of these letters were probably not written by Paul. Now, in this case, we have a way of evaluating whether Paul wrote a specific letter. If you've got seven letters that you're pretty sure somebody wrote, and you've got another letter you're not sure about, you can compare it to the seven. Now, isn't that what you said they did with uh, First and Second Peter, and they were completely different writing styles? That's how they knew that that wasn't the same author of those two? That's one of the reasons, just to quickly get here, that's one of the reasons it's believed that Luke and Acts was written by the same person. Not only is it church uh, history and church tradition, they also are very similar in the writing style of the same person. So chances are he wrote both of those books because the writing matches up. 
which is what scholars do. They take the letters of 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus and Colossians and Ephesians and 2nd Thessalonians and they compare them with the seven undisputed letters. And in every case, there are wide-ranging differences in writing style, in theology, in presupposed historical situation. Yes, and I wanted to make that clear. Because I, when I was going through school and not getting, before I discovered Bart Ehrman and other scholars, I was under the impression that Paul taught different than what Jesus did, and he did. And I'm going to be doing a document on the, or a, uh, uh, a part of this on my Christian series. So when we get to Paul and when Paul came around, because we're going to start on Christianity from the birth of Jesus and the claims all the way up to modern day Christianity as well. So, and all the branches and divisions. We're going to cover that, it won't be here for a while. But Paul had two sets of standards, one for the Jew and one for the Gentile. Paul himself kept the standards of the Jew. If you were a Jew and believed in Jesus, you continued to be a Jew. If you were a Gentile and believed in Jesus, you didn't have to follow all the laws. So circumcision, uh, dietary laws, he was hypocritical there. Yes, he was. But Paul often often goes back to Jerusalem for high and low festivals over and over and that is one of the reasons Paul's journeys were so long and they said he did all that walking and traveling well yes because he was often returning back to Jerusalem for the festivals throughout the year low and high festivals he was an observant Jew just like Jesus was an observant Jew so that makes it's important to point that out because they only started changing afterwards in a number of ways that make it pretty clear whoever wrote the book of first timothy it wasn't paul and the same for the other six and a lot of your core theology is coming from these books that are claimed to be written by paul that are pseudepigraphas aka forgeries so we just don't call them forgeries because it's religion and forgery is offensive to people so but we've had a few people already mention that who are christian and the old uh, uh scholars christian theolo scholars apologists in the second century, there was a letter that was discovered called Paul's letter to the Laodiceans. What it was, was a pastiche from four different letters that Paul wrote. So they're not even disputing that there was even writings in Paul's name outside of what we have in the uh, Bible and the canon. He's not even disputing that. This is a Christian. This is a Christian historian, theologian, and scholar. So, and he's not disputing it. What he will dispute is what's authentic and not, because he's a fundamentalist, but, you know, he's not disputing that there were forgeries under Paul's name. So you're, he's talking about this right now. And in the doctoral program at uh, Dallas Seminary, when I took canon, uh, we go over that letter. We actually translate it in class and discuss it and discuss why this should not be part of the canon. It's completely orthodox. It's quotations from four of Paul's letters. Yeah, so quotations. They, they knew that this stuff was happening. It's not like ministers and reverends and preachers and pastors that don't learn this stuff. This is some of the stuff I had problems with when I started going through my first year of uh, school to become a theologian, so to become a minister. So after I left Mormonism and I couldn't accept a lot of this history that was never taught to the average person that your minister, your reverend, your pastor knows. They know this. They know this. This is why a lot of them have faith crises that you don't know about and a lot of them are only doing this because it's now a job for them so let's continue on here but it's not written by paul <coughs> it was written in the second century so it did not go into the canon there's third corinthians third corinthians is also orthodox and it was written by a man who when he did it he did it because he said i really love the apostle paul and so i put his name on it so when it was discovered that he wrote this letter as a forgery he was kicked out of the church and 3rd Corinthians was considered not scripture. Yes, we've had that with many a book, many a book that they realize is not like 1st and 2nd uh, Clement. So they don't believe 1st and 2nd Clement are really written by uh, Clement of Alexander, or um, was it Clement of Alexandria? There's two Clements, I'm trying to remember which Clement it was, or was it Clement of Antioch? One of the Clements uh, that was under uh, Peter. So it's claimed to have written uh, first and second uh, Clement, and it wasn't, and that's why it was excluded, even though it's very, very orthodox. You know, that the various t documents of the New Testament are not written by the authors that, that the letters actually claim they are. See him stuttering? 
See him stuttering. Brock, Bach is stuttering. Let's go back here. Uh, 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 because it's hard to defend this. This is known history, guys. This is why we're doing this video. So when we get into Christianity, you Christians out there watching this cannot try to make certain claims. Because if you do and you haven't watched this, you're getting redirected back to this video. Considered not scripture. You know, that the various documents of the New Testament are not written by the authors that, that the letters actually claim they are. So he's not denying it. You know, this is known. This is not, uh, not evangelical, non-evangelical. So, uh, you know, he's a little more fundamental. He's not a liberal. So, but he's more fundamental. And they're not denying this, guys. They're not denying this. You know, Bart's right. There are many, many scholars who uh, accept pseudepigraphy as a part of what goes on in the New Testament. The debate is just how widespread it is, how many books it actually impacts. I think it'd be... How widespread it is, Bach says? Sorry, it wasn't Bach who was there. It was the host trying to uh, get that out as uh, less offensive as he could. But let's listen to what Bach says. goes on in the New Testament. The... No. Are not written by the authors that, that the letters actually claim they are. No, Bart's right. There are many, many scholars who uh, accept pseudepigraphy as a part of what goes on in the New Testament. The debate is just how widespread it is, how many books it actually impacts. How widespread? The debate is how widespread, how many books does it impact? Not that it exists, but how wide. Wow. Wow. I think it'd be fair to say that in Forged, as Bart says, well, he... Forged, guys. I cut out uh, the Forge talk in uh, Bart's um, uh, speech that he's doing because it's on his book Forged. He wrote a book Forged, so uh, talking about all this. I've owned it. It's a great book. I got the PDF uh, version of it, a great book, and he breaks this all down and why they know this. That, not that it's just an assumption, but why they know this. He's taking very common positions that, in fact, he has taken on really the maximal amount. Oh. So Bart always claimed that he so he covers a little bit, and Bach even says he gives him way more credit. Listen to what Bach says about him. I think it'd be fair to say that in Forged, as Bart says, well, he's taking very common positions, that in fact he has taken on really the maximal amount of Forged materials uh, that are suggested as, a, as opposed to a more minimal amount. That some so he's taken on the maximum amount of material compared to what the minimal could be. He's taken on the max that they know of. Some people would hold to who would accept the theory. If you add up the numbers, the way it works is this. There are a number of books in the New Testament that are anonymous. Yes, and we're going to get to that. Let's pull it back here so we don't miss any words. Anonymous, and we're going to hear Dr. Martin, uh, Professor Martin talk about that too soon. The New Testament that are anonymous. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are anonymous. Somebody later said they were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now that, that And we're going to go over that. We will go over because we do know who attributes to that. So we will go over that and give that defense of why and how it's wrong. That's not the author's fault. So those are not forgeries. Uh, you can make the same claim for the book of Hebrews, which was accepted into the New Testament because people, church fathers, thought Paul wrote it, but it doesn't claim to be written by Paul. So it and that one is a lot of friggin' scholars even admit Hebrews is not a Pauline writing. I knew that. That was the first, that was the first book we covered when I was in school. It's, it's actually anonymous. First, second, and third John, the name John doesn't occur in them. The author doesn't tell you what his identity is. Those are eight books that are anonymous in the New Testament. And that's why I said there is a difference between anonymous and pseudepigrapha. You have the seven letters of Paul that are writ really written by Paul. And the book of Revelation is written by some guy named John. He doesn't say which John he is. He just says his name is John, and there's no reason to disbelieve him. He doesn't say he's John the disciple. He's just some guy named John. So that's probably uh, an authentic book as well. So that you've got eight books, at least, that are certainly written in the names of the people claimed as their authors. Eight others that are anonymous that are probably falsely assigned to people. And you're left with 11, letters, 11, 11 books that are, that are what I'm calling forged. 11 books out of the 27, that's over a quarter of the books out of uh, the Bible, out of the New Testament forged. Just over a quarter. And Paul is accredited for the majority of that uh, book, of the 27. He's got the most uh, uh, writings in there, or claimed writings. Six of Paul's letters, I include the book of Acts, First and Second Peter, James, and Jude are not written by the people who are claimed as their authors.
Yes, if we can't say we know who uh, wrote Luke and we don't know who wrote Luke, it's accepted amongst all scholars of Luke and Acts are written by the same person. It's written by the same person. So if Luke isn't written by uh, Luke, then neither is Acts written by Luke. So that's why they get added together, guys. So, uh, I'll give you a quick uh, reason why he says that. Eleven books in the New Testament that are probably forged. One of the ironies of this, of course, is that the New Testament is not only the basis of Christian faith today, but has been for centuries, and most of the books of the New Testament celebrate the importance of truth. I am the truth, the light, the way. They celebrate the importance of telling the truth to one another. They celebrate the importance of Christ as... You testify that truth in the name of Christ, true or false? The truth as the true word of God who came into the world. How can a book that supports truth be based on a lie? How is it that an author who tells people to be truthful with one another, as the author of Ephesians does, how can he say that you are to take up the shield of truth? Bart, it's called hypocrite. They're being a hypocrite. Truth? How is it that truth is important to an author when he's lying about his own identity? Well, this is a very interesting... Thou shalt not lie. Is that one of the Ten Commandments? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Interesting irony that, uh, that requires, I think, some reflection. Yes, I think you guys need some reflection too. We've established four people here. We've established three Christian historian scholars so one of them being from Yale University, a very Ivy League school. This is an Ivy League uh, professor in his classroom. This is his curriculum. So the link is down below. You can watch his whole uh, semester. I've watched it what, four or five times. I love Fidel Martin. He's dry as dry at times, but when he cracks a joke, he's funny. But yeah, he's dry, but it's well worth watching. A lot of what we know about the names of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are attributed to early church fathers. That's exactly what it is. So we are told, it's not that we don't know who did it, so we are told who was the first father. So, and that's Papias, Papias, P-A-P-I-A-S. So what do we know about Papias? We are told a lot about Papias, but what we're told about Papias happens to be from a church historian named Eusebius, who later became a bishop of Constantinople. So, and what do we know about Eusebius? Because Eusebius is going to be the person that is telling us all of the stuff, even about the church of fathers that's going to be used in defense here soon. Eusebius of Caesarea has been nicknamed the father of church history. The father of church history. He compiled the church's official history. Even with the reading of one of Eusebius's 10 volumes, 10 volumes. Remember this guy, he wrote 10 volumes during his lifetime on the church. And not just on, uh, during his life, Eusebius, during a time period, we'll hear a little bit about this, I didn't want to make it too, too long, but was in prison during a time period under one of the um, Caesars, uh, along with uh, many other Christians, and his mentor was actually killed, uh, died after uh, being uh, released. He survived, but he spent a lot of time in captivity too where he couldn't write so just know that he couldn't write well in captivity of church history it becomes clear that he likely deserves the title eusebius lived from a.d 260 to 339. 260 260 jesus supposedly died approximately 30 a.d so that's 230 years after several generations later eusebius is writing Papias, Papias, so is from the turn of the second century. The second century is 100 AD on. So he is from the turn of the century. So our church fathers are all from the turn of the century. So all our church fathers claim supposed uh, lineage from a apostle of Jesus. So what we have here is Papias and Polycarp. So who are hearers, so they're not even told that they were followers, we're told they are hearers of John. 
So they were born 69 uh, and uh, around that, both of them around 70 AD to, and they lived to 150 and 200 ish. So uh, into the uh, third century. John the Baptist is accredited. John the Baptist is credited to being Polycarp's. Being Polycarp's. Oh, all well, my kids' stuff. Uh, uh, teacher. Polycarp, 69 to 155. I'm not making or splitting hairs. So what did we come over here? And let's go back. The average lifespan, 35 to 30 years of age, was the average lifespan. So, and let's see if I can go over here really quick. See, 35 to 40 years of age is the average lifespan for that time period and for a long time before and after. So that's why I was trying to establish this. If you were a peasant, your lifespan was less. Again, why I went to this uh, right here earlier. If you were someone like John, who is a fisherman, and Peter, who are fishermen, so your lifespan was shorter because you were spending all your time doing manual, hard, physical work from morning to night and basically eating and sleeping afterwards. John is older than Jesus, according to the Bible. He was two years older, which means if Jesus was born in about 4 BCE, so because Herod died in 4 BCE, so Jesus is born, uh, uh, according to the Bible, in 4 CE, John would be born in 6 CE, because you go back uh, in time, not up. We're going back before Christian era, so we go down a number. He was born in 6 CE, according to Christian tradition. No record, no factual, according to Christian tradition, John died in 100 AD, which means he was 106, three times the lifespan of the average person at that age. It just happens to be that all the apostles who had, you know, and uh, you know that the church builds its uh, record off of, all lived to about a 90 to 100 or older, every single one of them every single one of them according to church tradition if they weren't killed and martyred so in uh, you know certain places and we'll talk about the martyrdoms of apostles who went out so those who stayed and the authorities are built off of all 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 died so early they did not live three times their age we know that 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 would be they have to extend the ages of the apostles out they have to push the times back way further for the first, first church fathers who were all writing about 90 to 100 and later uh, CE, so later, 60 to 70 years after the event of Jesus dying, supposed to the event of him dying, we have people claiming, claiming they knew these apostles, claims. We have no verification. Our verification, our verification, and we're going to be getting to this, is this man right here, Eusebius. Let's hear more about Eusebius. A time that stretches through great persecution and pain for Christians. A time of great pain and persecution. So we have a church historian that everything is based off of. If you're not familiar with Eusebius, you need to be. Because Eusebius and Josephus are two of the main authorities ever cited. Eusebius is one of the biggest uh, uh, cited sources. So, you guys need to understand that. So, he's writing during a time of pain and tribulation. Uh, he's trying to be pro-Christian here. He's trying to push a pro-Christian agenda. And Eusebius has been accused by scholar after scholar for generations and hundreds of years of changing and doctoring church history. Even the atheist side has accused him of uh, doctoring Josephus' uh, writings. And then we'll get into that one at diff a uh, different time. Eusebius wrote more than just his famous church history. He wrote theological treaties, letters to churches, biographies, and defenses of earlier theologians. Defenses of earlier theologians. So if an earlier theologian, Polycarp, Arianus. So uh, who else do we have here? Uh, Papias, Ignatius of Antioch, all the early church fathers, Justin Martyr, all these early church fathers, when they said something contradictory to what you guys now believe, it was this guy right here, Eusebius, who changed it to what he said they meant. So what he said they meant, 
apologetics. Eusebius is really our, they say Justin Martyr is the first apologist really. No, because we don't know what he really said because Eusebius harmonized all the church history and it's agreed he harmonized it, which means he changed it. And even wrote to disprove heretics of his day. Under these circumstances, Eusebius began his church history. Born out of intense pain and death, church history would grow, develop, and reach its completion during a drastically different environment, a time of physical peace for the church, the time of Constantine. Yes, Constantine was when the church finally, for the first time ever, had a history where they were no longer the persecuted and it has remained the same to this day. So they've had good times and low times under other uh, Caesars, other emperors, so, but it wasn't until, and it wasn't until Constantine, and, and don't believe Da Vinci Code on when you hear about Constantine, go read what the historians have to say or listen to them or the scholars. So it was under Constantine that he harmonized the church. He didn't change stuff, but it was no longer the church was being persecuted. The per church now had a chance to argue amongst itself in open. So, and it was him who said, okay, if you guys want to argue over certain stuff, then call some councils and get your shit together and agree on it because you guys agree but you don't agree on how so agree on how not you know and uh, bart ehrman and a bunch of other guys say a much more elegant me than me so let's get back here and hear what we have to say about the historical side again from yale university's uh, professor uh, dale martin uh, and i just have to do it this today on the greco-roman world tell you everything you need to know about the greco-roman world I'll do a similar kind of lecture for everything you need to know about ancient judaism to put the new testament into its yes yeah, so and we need to know about the ancient world and he's going to confirm what dr uh, or professor bart ehrman said about the literacy but in a different way. Historical context, because it's material that you need to know. The Romans, when they came on the scene in the East, and they gradually became more and more powerful, they destroyed Corinth in a big battle in 144 BCE. Uh, Pompey was the Roman general who took over Jerusalem in 63 BCE. Before Christian era, so way before Jesus. So the Romans were in charge of Judea from 63 BCE on. Greek language, culture, and religions, Greek, different religions, and the syncretism, Greek education, the polis structure, all of these things remained in the East throughout the Roman rule. All that remained in the East. Is there any wonder why when the Gospel writers wrote the Gospels, they wrote them in Greek? We are told, and we can argue this, and there will be a video on this over the book of Matthew, that Matthew was originally Hebrew, then Aramaic, then into Greek. And there's arguments for both sides and good sides minus the Matthew. Because Hebrew was not written in, in the day. It was Greek. If you do want to argue, because the language was Aramaic that they spoke, Aramaic, you could argue that was written in Aramaic and then translated Greek. They never wrote in Hebrew. The Torah was written in Hebrew. The scribes, the Jewish scribes, Jesus and his followers were not the scribes. They fought against the scribes. Of the East. So the Gospels aren't biographies. So Okay, the first one was his early introduction to Roman uh, world. Now we're in the Jewish world here. He's talking about the Jewish world, and then we're going to begin into some of the Gospels. So it's the suffering of Jesus that oh. happens. Okay, so he's talking about... This is his, we're going into his historical time period of Palestine. So you can go, the uh, all three uh, lectures that he does there are in the descriptions in the bottom, as always. I put the uh, links into all my material on here. So he's going in and talking about the time frame of Jesus now and what it was like there. So this is in Palestine during Jesus' time. And in the East, throughout the Roman oh. rule of the East. Okay, sorry. Now so the Gospels aren't biographies, so it's... Okay, they're not biographies. He's telling you they're not biographies. He goes in explaining what a passion narrative is. I assume you guys all know who what a passion is. If you don't know what a passion narrative is, you need to go watch some other videos before you're over here. Not to be offensive, you need, you know, you, this is too much for you. It's the suffering of Jesus that happens at his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and then the resurrection. So that's what the authors of the Gospels are trying to tell you about. 
not historical events, but the passion of those events. Their, their passion, the gospel, the good news, not the historical news. All of that's part of what scholars call the passion narrative. Chapters and verse numbers weren't there in the original manuscripts. It was just written. In fact, they didn't even divide up words, and they had very little punctuation. Okay, this is going, and we're going to get more into this, and he's going to explain more. We're going to get a bit more explanation to prove my point here. So we've had proponents over the years argue for the defense that it was learned people that is claimed to be written. No, we started attributing that after we've taken the verses and started breaking them down. The original manuscripts before they even made it to us, the original before they even made it to us. Let's make that a known fact right now. We're not broken down into verses and paragraphs and chapters. They were one continuous flow broken up by capital letters only like you would see in Hebrew but done in Greek. So it's important to know that. Four different Gospels accepted by some people, five or six by other people. Five or six by others, because there's some other Gospels out there that are on par. It's just you can't verify who wrote it if it was someone who was a disciple of an Apostle. First and Second Clement. So, but we're not going to get into that one right now. What the point is, is we're establishing in first century Judaism so in the first century Roman world, so you would have been learning Greek. So they would have been, if you were going to be a learned person, a learned like Herod's son or a wealthy son, and you weren't in the fields all day or fishing all day, you were going to be learning Greek. So not Aramaic, not Hebrew writing. You would be learning Greek for those who were literate. Generally in Rome around this time, the four Gospels that we have in our Bible seem to have become the most popular accepted Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now some people still try to figure out that you've got four. Why do you have four? So you have other people like Tatian. He's on your handout list too. He decided to take the four Gospels and do an addition that would string all the stuff from the different four Gospels into one book. So kind of like a uh, condensed uh, version of the books together to harmonize them. So they were trying to harmonize these books and see, we have a history. We know who started the chains. It's not like we don't know. So who started the chains? We just don't know who originally wrote those books. So we just know who started to attribute the names to these books. So he made what we call the Dia Tesseron, which is a Greek word that means through four. He took four books and created one gospel out of it. You had other people uh, who said, well, um, uh, you accept the Gospel of Mark because Mark was a disciple of Peter. Uh, this is the way Papias believed. See, Papias, I mentioned Papias. Papias, we're told, Papias wrote, all we know about Papias, all we know about Papias at Papias' time is what Papias tells us about himself. The next thing we know about Papias is what Eusebius tells us. Well, Eusebius, Papias, if we take the common time era of life expectancy, so, and even try to stretch it to say, you know, by some time he even outlived, you know, the most average person and made it, to, you know, say even 50, 60, let's even stretch it 50, 60, he, 20, 30 years, he outlived it 20, 30 years, 35, you know, for, you know, 35, 40, so we'll say 60, 25, 30 years, I've stretched it. Papias didn't even come around to 89, so born in 89. Before he'd even be old enough to learn and educated, he'd be at least at, what, 10, 12, 13, if we want to give credit for the youngest hearing. So they need to stretch it, and it's Papias who tells us. We don't have any other confirmation. We just hear the word, the hearer of John, which means he heard the teachings of John. It doesn't say he followed John to hear the teachings. It doesn't say he was a disciple. Disciples used in the Bible. They use the word disciple to designate a direct person being taught by that teacher. We don't get that, so we're learning about Papias here. Elsewhere he said that Mark had traveled with, Rome to, with Peter to Rome, and Mark wrote down Peter's version of the gospel. And, that's, and so Papias said that's why Mark is reliable. Or people would say, Luke wrote down the gospel that Paul had preached, so Luke was authoritative. They also said, well, Matthew was actually one of the apostles, one of the disciples of Jesus, he's mentioned in the gospel, so he, he, the Gospel of Matthew is also by uh, a, a good one. And John. 
Yeah, so you see, they they do know this. They know where the tradition comes from, and they know through the tradition that these books had no known author. So based off of what they assumed, what they assumed based off of tradition already, they attributed these names to these books. John also was believed to be that. Now the problem with this is that Papias and these other people didn't really know what they were talking about. Martin's much more blunt than I am. Much more blunt than I am. And this is a Christian. He is a Christian. He believes in Christianity. I don't know how with what he knows, because that was the breaking of me. So, but he knows. Papias, for example, thought that the Gospel of Matthew had originally been written in Hebrew and only later translated into Greek. This is wrong. All, any of us who know Greek and know Hebrew can tell that the Gospel of Matthew was written in Greek. It doesn't look like... Okay, even before he gets into this argument right here, and he doesn't cover much time on it, remember that we learned, that we heard, and you can find other sources that verify it. So on this will go exactly to, you know, relating to Matthew. So, when the Romans took over a territory, so when they imposed education and learning on those who were going to be able to learn and be educated, the rich and the powerful, the wealthy, they were taught Greek. If Matthew was a tax collector, and we'll say for the sake of argument he was a tax collector, he's historical, there's no controversy about it, he worked for the Romans collecting tax for the Romans. What did I say they just taught for language? Greek. So if he's going to be writing down the numbers, he's going to be recording the numbers, it will be in Greek, not Latin. Greek. If he's working for the Romans, and he's not going to be using, because uh, the Romans did use the Latin, they also used Latin, but they didn't impose it on others, they imposed the Greek. For sake of argument, if he was a tax collector and he didn't use Greek, he would be using the Latin with the Romans. So why is he writing in Hebrew, Hebrew or Aramaic? Why would he? It was assumed, assumed by Papias, and that's our first earliest source, and that is going to come up later in the Matthew debate. It will. There's a debate over Matthew, the Hebrew Matthew. So, and that's for another episode. A translation from Hebrew. So we tend to doubt all of these different traditions that Mark was the disciple of Peter who wrote Peter's gospel, that Matthew was written by the actual disciple Matthew, that Luke was written by the disciple of Paul, and that John was written by the, the disciple John. So yes, and because the only verification we have on Papias and Polycarp and some of the others, that the only verification, I'm not lying guys, is Eusebius. Someone 230 years after 230 years after the death of Jesus, a hundred and some years after these people, someone from a time when Christians were being persecuted, when he was trying to defend the church against people they called heretics. So after they were safe to do so under Constantine. So he was an apologist. So he was harmonizing all historians and theologians outside of um, Fundamentalist groups and outside of evangelicals agree even the Catholic Church. He harmonized the church's history Basically what modern scholars believe is that all four of these Gospels Were anonymously published. They don't tell us who their author is They ought notice they don't they're not pseudonymous and see this There's is a difference between pseudonymous writings. See, don't get on me, guys. If you're watching this, don't get on me tripping up. Some of these words are not as easy as you would think uh, until you get it out, especially in front of a camera or in front of others. So remember I said we were going to learn more about this? I, I made this comment. Here's the difference. And this is why we can say there's forgeries in the Bible and then there's anonymous books in the Bible as well. There's a difference, but they both relate to the same thing. We don't know who the real author is and how reliable are they since we don't know who those authors are we can link them to. Easy for me to say. Pseudonymous, pseudopigrapha. Remember that word? Pseudopigrapha, pseudonymous. And anonymous. Anonymous means we don't know who wrote it. It's published without an author's name being listed. 
pseudonymous means it's published with a false name, a false author attributed. Pseudopigrapha. False name attributed to it. AKA forgery. The, go the four gospels are not <coughs> pseudonymous Excuse because me. the earliest manuscripts of these gospels, we believe, did not contain the title <coughs> Gospel of Matthew, Gospel of Mark, Gospel of Luke, Gospel of John. They just published the text as it was. At least we, if, if it ever did have an author's name attached to it, we don't have any evidence in the manuscript history. Nor, nor do Papias and all the other fathers say that we have a name attributed to them. It comes based off of oral tradition in the church that Papias made those assumptions and Eusebius backed him up. And dates do not correspond. Go check the dates of the founding uh, church fathers, the early apostolic fathers. Check those dates. Check the dates of the apostles who died and see how old they have to be to make them work. So, are you telling me that only the apostles of Jesus ended uh, up living extreme old ages? Extreme old ages, so just so they can get books written by secondhand accounts? So, why don't those books say, well, according to John the Beloved or John the uh, Disciple of Jesus, or according to Mark the Disciple of Peter, who was a apostle of Jesus? Why doesn't it say, according to Matthew, why doesn't it say, I am Matthew, I am an apostle of Jesus. Why well, doesn't say, I am John, the apostle of Jesus who walked with them. I am that person and this is my first hand account of what happened. It's not in there. Because there's third and fourth hand accounts 30 to 70 years later. Closer to 40 to 70 years after the event took place if it did. We don't know who wrote them. There was no chapters. There was no verses. It was one continuous line broken up by capital letters. And then someone broke them into verses and then into or paragraphs and then into uh, chapters. That's not how we originally had them. And we need to know this before we go into any more Christian uh, topics here. Because if you don't know this stuff, then you're never going to have logical, rational uh, discussion. Nor do we have any evidence in any other uh, historical place have any evidence in the manuscript history, nor do we have any evidence in any other uh, historical place. None at all. What happened was these names got attached to these documents. And that's a, a, eventually how they got included into the canon. People thought that these documents eventually were written by the people whose names that they possess, and therefore they thought they had some kind of connection to the apostles. Oh, and there you go, ladies and gentlemen. That is how we got those names. And we got, you know, arguments here. I got arguments. So, uh, Zon Devrian, uh, was a website. Let's pop you guys over here, guys, really quick. Oh, let's... Let's... So, who wrote the Gospels and how do we know for sure? And this is all... Tradition considers these men the authors, but there's one problem. Not one of these books names its authors. This is an anti. This is just a informational. These guys aren't trying to disprove. These guys are just being unbiased and presenting the facts. And they're telling us how we know. How we know. So, and they'll give the scholars argument, and then they're going to give you their argument for why we know. So, Papias mentions Matthew wrote about Jesus. So this is the earliest evidence. It all comes down to Papias telling us. Guys, it all comes down to Papias telling us. So the only person that can really confirm Papias, and I use the word confirm, is Eusebius. And we saw how far later he came. So he's not even in a few generations. So, it's highly organized. Being a tax collector, let's go over here. Second point they make why it's correct. This is why they say it's correct. Being a tax collector required constant upkeep of records and accurate relaying of information. Matthew needed to be organized to do his job. So, I made the counter argument to this already. So, why didn't he use Latin or Greek? Latin was the official language of Rome. 
Greek was the official written language of Rome and the official language to learn. So he would have written his book in Greek, like we have it, but Papias argues it was written in Hebrew, then translated to Aramaic, then translated to Greek, and we will see this in another video. So Papias tells us this. Papias, 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 Papias. So the parallel passages in other synoptics refers to the tax collector called Jesus calls Levi. Levi and Matthew can be interchangeable. Yes, they can. But then we have a problem. We have the synoptic problem, which we're going to cover. And this is why you guys needed to know this. This is why before we get into the synoptic problem, and yes, that's what it's called, the synoptic problem. So, and they call it the synoptic gospels, uh, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke, not John. So three out of the four gospels are the synoptic gospels. And the synoptic gospels are believed to be harmonized together and Matthew does not come first. It's believed Mark comes first. It's believed on the main, there's different hypotheses, but the main hypothesis is Matthew and Luke took from Mark and another source, Q. And we'll go over Q some other time in our next, you know, when we get here. So they believe that there is more than one source for Mark, but Mark comes first and Matthew and Mark, uh, you know, worked off of that source and Q, which is German for uh, QL, which just means source, unknown source, source. QL uh, for source, German. That's where, because it was uh, hypothesized first by uh, some German scholars. Not to get too much in onto this, but that is our problem with the synoptic gospels. You can't use the synoptic gospels as your defense because there's the synoptic problems within the gospels. And Bart Ehrman has some great videos on it, not this video. Just not this video at this time. So it's just more of the synoptics, more, you know, the church described the book to Matthew, so we're going back to uh, uh, Papias. So once we get to Papias, then we get to Polycarp, who came just a little bit later, who's another claimed follower. So, and it just comes off to claims, claimed followers, claim after claimed follower. So, and we don't have anything, you know, concrete, no concrete, none. So if Ignatius says, you know, who came after, you know, a generation or so after Papias, mentions Papias and mentions, slightly mentions, so some of uh, or, uh, what Papias said, and it was Ignatius who used the word hearer of uh, uh, John, hearer, not disciple, hearer. So, and it's Eusebius who tells us disciple, we have a problem. So we can't be using that. If I go to the six ancient sources that we've already used, and this will be down in the description, so it's pretty much the same thing. They're using second and uh, first and second century, uh, you know, uh, writers, uh, late se uh, first century, second, third century writers. So they're going to Eusebius in the fourth century. So then we'll skip uh, uh, Irenaeus of Lyon, which was Gaul or France. So around 180 AD, let's see if I can pop this up bigger for you guys. So we're going 180 AD. So that's 20 years before, you know, uh, Ignatius is born 20 years before Papias dies. So supposedly dies. So we got evidence from ancient Christian fragments, fragments they say. So, and let's look at what, you know, uh, the fragments are. Next we have the uh, Maturian Canyon. So fragments is the Maturian fragments is the oldest lifted list of New Testament books we have discovered. So it's a list of the books that were in the New Testament. We're not debating what books were in the New Testament or when they were in the New Testament. That's not a debate. Well, a debate is who actually wrote them and so which ones are actually um, anonymous and which ones are um, uh, pseudo apocryphal. Nothing in here has <coughs> anything. Go here. The links in the, down here on the bottom. The links in the bottom. You guys read it. We're just closing up. It's nothing. Evidence from a Gnostic heretic. So, okay. They're going to Gnosticism. Big deal. Big friggin' deal. Evidence for a Gnostic heretic. So, not a big deal for me. None of this goes to any mounting evidence. 
So to support that, we know who wrote the Synoptic Gospels, who any of the Gospels. It does not go to any evidence or argument supporting argument for the uh, challenge letters, epistles of Paul, at all. So it is what it is. This video has demonstrated beyond any doubt that we cannot know who wrote the uh, four Gospels and we cannot accept the uh, disputed letters of Paul, the six disputed. So we can't. We already have Christians, three Christians and one atheist saying the same thing I am. The only difference is, is the one atheist says you can't trust it and the other three say, well, sure you can. So sure you can. One's actually lying to you and telling you why you don't leave uh, the pseudopigrapha books aren't included in the canon. And Bart Ehrman clearly shows you they are in the canon. So how do you how do you trust these guys? So how do you trust these guys? I'm so yeah. So as we go forward in our next uh, next discussions, as we get ready and head out and explore uh, explore the problems with Christianity and the Bible and the New Testament, you need to take into account that we are relying on third and fourth hand information from the Gospels from anonymous authors 40 to 70 years, 80 years after the event took place. You guys are relying on disputed works of Paul that we know are uh, pseudopigrapha with forgeries, not anonymous, but forgeries. Pseudo-anonymous, people making false claims intentionally. And we know there is books left out that were exactly under the same criteria. So we, before we get into it, we have to accept this, acknowledge it. I'm sorry if you don't like that, but that is just the way it's going to go. Just the way it's going to go. Hopefully you guys got some information out of this. You guys keep it real. On Techno next time, DAA saying peace out.